New to Linux Forensics or just don't do it enough to be familiar? In this video, we will be looking at a quick reference guide from Magnet Forensics. Please help me out by hitting the subscribe button and don't stop believing. The guide I'm going to talk about in this video can be downloaded from the Magnet Forensics website via the link in the description. Instead of looking at the reference guide as is, I'm going to break it down into a user space where the artifacts are bound to a specific user account versus the system space where the artifacts are generated due to system level operations. The first item on the list is the home folder. Every user on a Linux system has a home folder where they keep their files. By default, each user's home folder is under the path of slash home slash and then their username. The only exception is the root user whose home folder is slash root. Let's take a look at the slash home folder for this system. As you can see, it contains folders which are in the name of each user on the system. The user of Kane, the user of Blue Monkey Forensics, and then we can also take a look at the slash root folder, which is the home folder for the user root. And this is important in forensics because you may want to see if any unauthorized accounts were created. Another location to look for accounts is the slash etsy slash password file. This file contains every account on the system, including system created accounts and not just user accounts. The home folder for each account is listed. And from a forensic standpoint, it could be of interest to see if any accounts were created which were not expected. A file that usually comes paired with the etsy password file is the slash etsy slash shadow file. This file contains the same number of lines as the password file, but it contains the password hash and the password scheme. So the bad guys can steal this file and try to crack the passwords on this machine. Note that you need to have the root privileges in order to view this file. And that makes sense since the information is so sensitive. The next file listed on the quick guide is the slash etsy slash sudoers file will determine which users have root privileges to use the sudo command. So if we do a more of slash etsy sudoers, we will get a permission denied error because root is the owner and only root and anyone in the root group is allowed to read this file. And if we do an ls minus l on slash etsy slash sudoers, we can see that only root is listed in here. So since the user Kane is part of the sudoers file, we can actually do sudo more etsy sudoers. And now we can see the contents of the file because we have root privileges. Now let's create a new user who will not have any root privileges. So I'm going to do sudo user add dash c double quotes nina bolt double quotes dash m dash s slash bin slash bash nina. And then let's give Nina a password by doing sudo password Nina. And I'm just going to give it a password, type it in again. And now I'm going to do sudo dash Nina to sign in as Nina. And now that I'm Nina, I can do a sudo more slash Etsy sudoers. It will ask me for my password and then tell us that Nina is not in the sudoers file and that this incident will be reported. So basically we can see here that if you are in this file, then you can perform a sudo. And the last file in this series is the slash etsy slash group file, which contains all of the groups on this machine and the members of those groups. So we can do sudo more etsy groups. And we can see the various different groups and all of the members within those groups. The next set of files is the web browsing activity. So depending on which browser you're using, the artifacts will be in different directories. So for Google Chrome users, the artifacts will be under the username and then their .config folder and then Google-Chrome. For Mozilla Firefox users, the artifacts will be under the username's home folder slash dot Mozilla slash Firefox. For Opera users, 
The artifacts will be under the user's home folder slash dot config slash capital O for Opera. And then there's also the dot cache file under the user's home folder. Hopping over to the second column of this guide, let's take a look at the files that may be of interest for every individual user. So first off, when a user types in a command on the command line in a bash shell, all of the commands are kept in a log called the history file, which is in the user's home folder named dot bash underscore history. So for this account of Nina, I can do a more of tilde slash dot batch history, and it will tell us that there is no such file or directory. And so the reason why that is, is that the file only gets created once a user logs out of a shell. So in the case of Nina, we just logged into her account and have not logged out. So we get that error. So let's go ahead and log out and then log right back in. So I'm gonna type exit to log out. And then in the shell, I can do su su dash Nina. Now I'm back in Nina's account again. And I can do more of dot bash underscore history. So now we see the commands that we had typed previously. One thing to note is that every time a user logs out, the file gets appended with the new commands that were typed in that session. And remember that every user can have a dot bash underscore history file if they are running the bash shell. If they're running Z shell, then the history file is named dot Z shell underscore history. The next artifact to look at is the trash can. If you are using the mate desktop environment, then you can look at tilde slash dot local slash share slash trash to see what's in the trash can. Other desktop environments of GNOME, XFCE, KDE, Cinnamon, etc., all have similar locations. So let's go ahead and cd into tilde dot local slash share slash trash. If we do an ls dash l capital R for recursive, there are three subfolders here expunged, files, and info. The expunged folder is a temporary storage space for files which are being emptied from the trash can. The file folder contains files which were put into the trash can until the trash can is emptied. And the info folder contains a file associated with each file placed into the trash can. And each file has the original path name of the deleted file as well as the timestamp of the deletion. Note this only keeps track of the files put into the trash by the GUI desktop environment and not anything that was deleted via the command line. There is no easy recovery of files deleted via the command line. The next artifact is looking at recent files. So to see the recently used files, we can look in this folder. The home folder slash dot local slash share. And within there, there is a file called recently-used.xbel. So let's go ahead and vi that file and take a look. We can see here that the path name of the file that was added uh, is included. The timestamp of when the file was added, modified, and visited are available. And once again, this only applies to files which were touched by the GUI. And files which were manipulated via the command line are not included here. And we can do a grep of the phrase bookmark space href of the recently dash used.xbl to see all of the files that were recently used. And the last section here is the SSH related files. So to see the secure shell related files, we can look at this folder under .ssh in every user's home folder. This will give you the default location for all user-specific configuration and authentication information. I'm going to do an ls-l capital R. And here we see a few files. The first file we can talk about is the one called authorized underscore keys. This file lists out the public SSH keys that can be used for logging into the user's account for which the file is configured. And all of the SSH authentication keys copied to the server from remote clients are stored here. Another file of interest is known underscore hosts. 
The contents here are essentially the SSH fingerprints of machines you've already connected to. These fingerprints are generated from the remote server's SSH public key. When you SSH into a remote machine for the first time, you will be greeted with a message that authenticity of the host can't be established and present you with a ECDSA key fingerprint. If you answer no, then the connection will end. And if you answer yes, then the remote host fingerprint will be saved to the known host file. The file config contains the per user configurations for running the SSH program with settings such as port forwarding, Kerberos options, etc. And lastly, the files that start with ID underscore anything will be the private and public keys. The public keys end in the .pub extension, and you may have different keys depending on the encryption algorithm employed. These are just some of the artifacts which you may find useful when examining a Linux machine. In this video, we focused on the user space information. See this other video for system-related artifacts. For more videos on the Linux command line, make sure you watch these videos here. To see other videos of tools of the Kane Forensics Distro, click here. Make sure you click on the blue monkey to subscribe. Thanks for your time and happy hunting.